Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm James McLean, a group product manager at App Omni, and I'm excited to be here today with two of my colleagues, Alec Pfeiffer and Joseph Thacker, to discuss making sense of SaaS permission models and untying the Gordian knot. Alec, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Alec Pfeiffer. I'm on the AO Labs team here as the team lead. I'm also on the product team. I've been with App Omni for a little over two years now, and I'm based in Colorado. Joseph, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm Joseph Thacker. I'm a senior offensive security engineer, basically just like a, a SaaS hacker. I've been at App Omni for a little over three years. Um, so I'd talk to you all day. Fantastic. Alec, could you give us an overview of a couple of the topics that we're going to be discussing today? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we can just go ahead and kick it off with the, the general introduction. I appreciate you kind of setting the table here. What we want to do is explore why effective and secure permissioning in SaaS applications is so difficult. I mean, we know that effective and secure permissioning is absolutely needed within any security program, but there's some particular challenges with SaaS that we want to explore in this conversation. So just kind of starting with the current state of the world, you know, SaaS applications continue to just expand, both in terms of breadth of the number of applications and their adoption by companies. You know, Not only are they just used by businesses, but they're increasingly used in, in business critical roles. We got to really look at how this growth then creates the increasing dependency on these applications, which again, increases their profile for the need to be secure. If we take a principles-based approach for security, and we look at the CIA triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, you know, really effective permissioning and least privilege are essential to this. Can you answer, do the right people and only the right people have access to the right information and right entitlements and make sure that nobody else does? And so, you know, when we look at SaaS, vendors build in a tremendous amount of customization capabilities into these products because that's what customers demand from them. Customers, and especially large enterprise customers, they have a high degree of customization in everything they do. They want these products to fit exactly the business use case that they have, and they don't want to change their process for a tool. So these SaaS vendors create tremendous customization. With that becomes a high degree of flexibility and granularity to permission models. Uh, but really what this increase in capability does is increases the risk of misconfiguration. It makes it more difficult to properly provision these. Even though you have permission at a very granular level, you kind of expose yourself to a lot of foot guns here that if not taken care of, really end up biting you in the butt. And so this challenge, it exists at a single application, but we all know that not a single business out there only uses one SaaS application. And in fact, most enterprises are using hundreds of applications, some ranging close to thousands. It's, it's, it's really incredible, um, both of what applications are currently used at a wide scale, but also what's used at a, you know, kind of maybe a niche use case. It still exists within your portfolio. It still needs to be secure. It still needs to have effective permissioning. And that's probably why we kind of called this the Gordian knot, because untangling this all to understand what's actually going on is extremely difficult. And if you were just starting out from a greenfield and you're deploying this application for the first time, Maybe it's a bit simpler at that point. It's still going to be difficult, but maybe it's uh, doable. But the problem is you're inheriting these applications, you know, some being used for over a decade. The, the challenges that you are facing have been tied in into sorts, all sorts of not the scar tissue within the organization of the permissioning models. It's, it's very difficult to actually understand what's going on. And all this just creates a massive misconfiguration based risk that enterprises are faced with today. Whether they really acknowledge it or not, or they, they identify it at the time or not, it's there. And we see that time and time and again on various breaches and incidents that occur because of misconfiguration or can tie them their route back to misconfiguration. And really what this requires is a comprehensive understanding of the applications themselves, how they do permissioning, and then doing that effectively, but then continuously monitoring it to make sure that you know, no, no environment is static. It's highly dynamic. How do you maintain continuous monitoring to ensure your visibility of that environment maintains you, know, you have the right amount of visibility, so you can continue to make sure that as that environment evolves, it evolves in a secure manner. And so we kind of started touching into it a, a little bit earlier, or just with my last comment, but the solution is multi-pronged, just like so many things. There isn't a silver bullet. Part of it is partnership between application administrators and security teams, You know, kind of bridging that divide, which we'll go into in more detail. A lot of it's just unpacking how these SaaS applications actually do uh, permissioning. 
a massive part is continuous monitoring because again these these environments are dynamic and then really utilizing a SaaS security posture management tool or an SSPM that allows you to do it at scale. If you're trying to do it within the application, theoretically possible. In practice, it's highly improbable, if not impossible to do. Thanks for the overview. I was really excited to dive into a few of those topics you just touched on and dig into some of the solutions to address the complexity here. Let's take a step back and zoom out and dive into some of, or at least set the stable with the current state of the challenge of SaaS security. Could you speak a little bit to some of the factors and the challenges um, that modern organizations are dealing with today in SaaS security? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, it's it's in many ways, it's a, a house divided, and which is kind of why, why we went with this route of kind of describing it in this manner, because at the start, SaaS applications continue to grow, both in terms of expansion within the existing applications use, but any team knows on a daily basis, nearly a daily basis, uh, maybe even hourly basis, you have requests coming in for a enterprise using an additional SaaS application, whether it's coming from an individual user or an org- organization user. So that adoption continues to grow. And as that adoption grows, so does the scale and complexity of the problem. Next, you have just a variety of SaaS-specific risks that exist. And a lot of them, I think, start at just the divide that often occurs between app owners and security teams. So app owners understand those applications. They may even be operating as an administrator for this application for a decade plus, right? Some of these applications have been around for a while. Either way, they may have some very tailored training they've gone through. Uh, vendor-specific certification processes, so they know how this application works. Uh, but rarely does that training and experience include robust security education on how to effectively secure, how to effectively permission this. But then we look to the security side. Security teams have that security expertise. They understand security principles, and they understand generally how to apply them in most situations. But each of these SaaS applications presents a unique challenge. So you have one side that understands the app and the ecosystem. You have one side that understands security, but you don't have the overlap between the two that allows them to really have this shared understanding of both management and security of the application. So it requires this bridge to be built between these two teams if it doesn't already exist. And lastly, for customization versus security, I mentioned a little bit on the last point of discussion, but enterprises want vendors to build customization into their products. So vendors do so. But at the same time, that increases the risk of of shooting yourself in the foot, having that misconfiguration-based risk. So right now, the push is for continued customization and not necessarily saying tone down product functionality in order to have a maybe a more secure product. But holistically, we just see the trend moving more and more towards customization, which means more and more misconfiguration-based risk, James. Interesting. And I'm assuming that customization piece really comes along with more complexity within the SaaS apps to enable that customization, making the apps more robust. Can we get into an example of a SaaS application? I know we talked about some of the complexity of the permission models and the Gordian knot. Let's use an example like an HR system like Workday and really dig into some of the complex nature of these permissioning systems. Alec, can you kind of cover Workday or an HR system? Absolutely, I would love to. So Workday is an amazing product. it has a it's a market leader for HR systems for a reason. There's a high degree of configuration in this application, and that can be seen in its permissioning model. It's highly complex. It allows you to do a lot of very interesting things, very powerful things. But with again, with this complexity, this is a good example of how that complexity doesn't create necessarily a easier product to implement, right? Like we showed uh, a, a similar slide to a customer the other week. They had the Workday admin on the call and they had the security team on the call. And the Workday admin was thrilled that we were bringing this up because this was a challenge that she had been trying to articulate and convey to the security team for literally years of how difficult it actually is. Because from the security team standpoint, hey, just make sure that the right people have the right permissions to the right things. It's not it's not that hard, right? Like, it, it, but without understanding the complexities of Workday, without being able to visually see users, roles, security groups, they all exist. And what makes it more complex is, you know, you may have a security person or an, an app administrator looking at these and say, okay, I understand how users are done. I understand how roles are done because I've been around the block a while. But each one of these applications does it in a slightly unique way. 
So, you know, when you look at users, you have workers and you have system integrators, not terribly unique, but some of the ways they're implemented are. Then you have roles. And for many that have worked with roles, we know that these define specific sets of permissions and are generally associated with security groups. Um, then when you start looking at roles can be assigned to a security group, you can have supervisor organizations that utilize established hierarchies for reporting. You have domains that serve as categorizations of different types of permissionings. I mean, we, we wanted to visually represent this and I wanted to talk through it just a little bit because you see like you see it visually, you hear it audibly. It's complex. It's hard to understand. And this isn't to pick on Workday. Workday is a phenomenal application, but it can be complex to administer. There's a reason why they have a developer conference. There's a reason why they have such a robust ecosystem of professionals that dedicate their entire career to Workday, because there's so much powerful functionality that's difficult to unpack. But that would be a challenge if Workday was the only SaaS application you're using, but it just isn't. We all know that, right? Like there's not a single, or maybe there's a single organization, but no major enterprise out there is just using Workday and they're not using any of the SaaS application. They're using hundreds of SaaS applications. So now take the complexity that we see here and multiply that by a hundred plus applications, almost certainly hundreds. And not, then now say you security team of five people, solve it. Administrators, make sure that everything's secure, make sure everything's permissioned appropriately. It's just incredible. And, and again, this flexibility is needed uh, by enterprises, but it presents this double-edged sword with misconfiguration risks. Absolutely. And it's funny, you just mentioned this, the number of SaaS applications. I know right now we're just talking about Workday, but we're currently using Zoom to discuss Workday, which is a SaaS app. These slides were probably made in Google Workspace or Microsoft 365. Joseph, I know you look at sort of the scale of a lot of these SaaS applications, go deep on a bunch of them. Can you piggyback off of what Alec was talking about and really sort of dig into or um, elaborate on some of the challenges of the, just the scale of the, um, SaaS sprawl and the SaaS ecosystem and securing that large volume of SaaS applications? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, number one is what Alec was already saying, right? As, as companies grow and when you reach the scale of an enterprise, the number of teams that you have is ridiculous, right? And each of them need their own permission sets. And then that has to be propagated a across multiple SaaS apps. And that's where point two kind of comes in. Market research varies. In our experience, it seems like most enterprises are using at least 50 SaaS applications. And just the idea that a small team of people or even, you know, as some, as some orgs, it's even, you know, it's just a couple, a handful of people could wrap their mind around both the security settings the third-party integrations, the granular roles and permissions for 50 applications is just absurd, right? I think that's why SSPM has blown up as a market. I think that's why the founders at App Omni started our organization. Uh, and so whenever you layer that on top of the number of teams, the number of staff that most of these companies have, the functionality differs in all the SaaS applications, right? And so it's hard to apply the, the know-how and the security expertise for knowing which teams need access to what and balance that against usability. And so not only do you have to have a bigger and bigger security team that's growing, but then they also have to stay on top of the uh, new features and the new security implementations that actually get rolled out across all these apps. So um, not only is it not feasible to understand and grok and be able to apply that knowledge across 50 SaaS applications, but it's not feasible to keep up with the new features and the new security settings. They get tweaked and modified and added to those SaaS applications on top of that. You know, and, and that is a big enough problem in and of itself, right? Like that's its own Gordian knot uh, to use the analogy of, of the talk. But what, what makes it even worse is that a lot of these organizations will have dozens, if not hundreds of like their own instances for each SaaS application. For example, really large organizations, you know, enterprises in particular will often have dozens or hundred instances of just Salesforce, let alone shadow IT <laughs> among sales teams or shadow IT of like users who are spinning up their own Slack instances for teams within the org um, and not just in the actual organization's overall Slack channel. So uh, what, you, what you end up with is um, an even bigger mess of, hundreds of instances across, you know, dozens or hundreds of applications for thousands of users. And, and it just becomes really, really unwieldy. And when I was, when I was actually making this slide, it jumped out to me like, man, is this just SaaS's fault? Uh, but, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think you'd end up with a really similar problem if all of this had just stayed on-prem. It's not like a cloud or a SaaS specific issue. 
Um, and, and, and the trade-off is actually really good, right? We get applications that are custom built for very specific use cases that they're really good at. So it's a big problem that we need to tackle. Uh, but I think SSPM is kind of stepping in as a solution. So you talked about a couple of the problems with securing SaaS at scale and then also the drivers for those problems. Can you speak to a couple of the risks that those problems create for security teams? And then also sort of why these risks may be unique to SaaS or SaaS specific, but also agnostic to the platform per se. Curious to get your thoughts on how how these challenges result in SaaS specific risks. Yeah, I've got kind of a varied background. So I started my security career in a SOC as like an analyst um, and then kind of lightly did some engineering work and slowly transitioned into that world. But throughout that whole time, I've also been doing a lot of, of bug bounty hunting. And um, at App Omni, you know, I've been doing a lot of exploratory security research. What's interesting is there's a lot of SaaS specific attack vectors. And so I wanted to cover some of those here because they're they're pretty interesting and, and things that people who come from a more traditional, you know, network based security mindset or framework or kind of just if you grew up eating and breathing security some of those risks and challenges have really evolved over time as everything has moved to uh SaaS. some of the some of the um ones that, that jump to me are things like let's just look at the access so how, how does someone actually get access into your SaaS application one there a lot of these SaaS applications have guest user features and um, you can actually check out some of our blogs on ao labs where aaron has found some really nice guest user vulnerabilities there's also credential stuffing. So the thing about these SaaS applications, oftentimes is they'll have their own login. And a lot of companies will use SSO or OAuth, but many times they won't. And so when there's these big breaches, uh, attackers can spray those exposed credentials for every company who has employees in that breach for every SaaS application. And so, you know, even if they get in in only one of those, it may be a foothold that, that allows them to expand. So when your when your teams are using 30 SaaS applications, if, if you don't have robust OAuth or SSO there, then there's a, there's essentially 30 different logins, like 30 different you know post forms that can be filled with the stuff credentials to potentially get access. Um, and the persistence route, um, that's one thing that I think is actually very interesting. And I bet most of our listeners have some pretty big risk here. How many people have access to the service account username and passwords or shared accounts or have spun up API tokens or API keys that they're still in production and use today that, you know, fired or employees who were let go, you know, would have had access to during their time there or are just stored in version control, right? Like maybe they're stored in Git and, and you know, hundreds or thousands of users have access to those tokens or those keys. Now, those those people like get, get let go, they can still use those tokens or those keys to log right back in or to access data via the API. They can also, you know, a malicious insider or someone who gets guest user access to something they shouldn't could set up a schedule report to just exfiltrate data constantly to um, their own email address or their own server, et cetera. So, you know, there's lots of ways that you can access or even get persistence that are very different in SaaS land versus the traditional, you know, network security route. Uh, I'll cover a couple of these others as well. So lateral mover and privilege, privilege escalation are kind of similar in SaaS space. I, I, in my own notes, I often combine those. Because what all you're doing is you're just getting access to an account you didn't have access to before. Maybe they're at the same permission level. Maybe they're an admin or an owner. Often in the SaaS services, it's kind of the same attack vector, right? If you're grabbing shared credentials, they might have more access than you do. They might have the same access. And it's just a second account that you can keep control of if you were to get kicked out of the first one. Maybe it's pivoting. So um, often these SaaS applications will have some sort of way to get access back to the host, whether it's like a log me in type feature where you can do a remote desktop, whether it is, you know, once you get access to their email, you can like often find credentials in there. Many times in the GitHub projects or GitHub files, you'll find ways to access hosts directly. Maybe there'll be hard coded credentials. You can just RDP into specific hosts. Kind of similar on the privilege escalation. Sometimes there might be third party grants where the third party app or the third party provider is actually given a higher level of privilege than the user themselves, but the user has access to the way that third party integrates into the system. And so that'll give them a greater level of access. And then as I mentioned in the in the schedule reports under persistence, the exfiltration methods are kind of endless, right? It's very often just browse to this URL and because it's shared or because there's a misconfiguration, you can just access the data directly. <clears throat> but some sometimes it's also via API use, right? As I talked with the leaked or shared keys or tokens, you can just, you know, hit those API point endpoints to download the data. And what's really interesting is from a defensive agent standpoint, 
if you're not getting your audit logs for all of your SaaS applications, which is actually, you know, extremely difficult and something that most organizations aren't doing because one, they come in different formats. So you have to normalize them Two, once you've normalized them, you have to make sense of them so that you can write detection lo logic detection rules. Sometimes they're very, very frequently overly verbose. So you hook it up and it completely overruns your SIM because there's way too many logs. <clears throat> there's not good filtering there. And then also, let's say you do have an org where you've got 100 Salesforce instances across your sales team. Are you going to have every single one of them go in and set up audit logging so that you can get all of those logs? Most companies don't. And so if an attacker were to get in there and use the API to download a bunch of data, PII, PHI, that they shouldn't, there's, you would have no clue. You'd have no chance of actually catching it. But by... Um, as we'll talk about in the solution, you know, some, someone like App Omni or SSPM solution can write specific rules that are to detect those types of exfiltration. So I'll save that for a little bit later. But um, James, did you have a question? No, you uh, you beat me to it. So yeah, <laughs> basically, I was. I mean, you, you read my mind, right? We we talked about some of the complexity with the permission models. We talked about some of the challenges at scale and manages across multiple SaaS platforms. Some of the unique SaaS specific risks and how they result from that. I guess the question you jumped was, so what? What do I do about it? Um, what can we do or what would you suggest organizations do to pro proactively address uh, these specific risks and challenges, Joseph? Real quick, if I, yeah. if I can jump in real quick to ask, almost yeah, preempt yeah. that and stick on the, the risk for a second of the challenge. Um, we as a community love to focus on the very sexy attacks, right? Like we love to focus on the you know some crazy string of seven o days that was daisy chained together that took down this massive target right like we always want to explore like the very complex and the complicated joseph I, I know we've talked about this before but there's the idea of almost like a one click attack right like oftentimes you know the most common attack method which is often the one that bites us is not complex it's pretty simple and it just utilizes or exploits some basic, basic misconfiguration or misuse. Is there a hypothetical attack that is, you know, kind of indicative of this one click attack that we've uh, kind of discussed before that'd be worth going through together? I think it highlights, you know, SAS is a green field in many ways, right? Like if you look at the types mm -hmm. of attacks that are perpetrated, they're they're old news, right? They're, they're something that would fit in the internet of you know 2021, 2022. They're not they're not modern attacks, it seems, but SAS is such a green field that you you can achieve a tremendous amount of damage with just a simple attack. Yeah, I mean the, the the most obvious example, right, is just an exposed file. Not Google Drive is the one that everyone thinks of immediately because it's uh, you know the most heavily used. But there's dozens of other products that just let you share files externally with anyone who has the link, and you can also do that in many of these apps via the folder. So what will happen is you know a folder will get shared and it'll have some, you know, not that sensitive data in it. Like maybe it's an outline for a new project or an outline for a, uh, and, and the reason why it'll get shared externally is because like maybe you have a group of contractors who are working on a, like a landing page for a custom site. You're, you're doing like a, you know, landing page for an event you're doing and you're having a contracting team build out that landing page. And so they'll create a, a folder in Google drive and share it publicly with anyone who has the link. Just, you know, no one's going to find the link, but it'll just be them. And then what happens eventually is the contractor will start using the folder. I may or may not have found this exact thing on a, on a, on a Fortune 100 company. Um, and then what happens is they'll start using the folder. There's an Excel sheet that goes, or you know, a, a Google sheet that goes in there that now has credentials to log in to the Drupal or the WordPress page. And they keep adding credentials to it. And then eventually that link gets out. And so it can get out a bunch of different ways. But, you know, the short way to say it is like either the web archive or Alien Vault OTX, essentially links that get exposed to the internet often find their ways into these databases that hackers can are then able to view and then just by one click they access the google drive folder they have access to the credentials to log into the site now they're logging into an actual landing page for your company they can one get the data out of there directly because there'll be user information they can also post and deface the website or you know use it for phishing etc and i'll just say one more example is that um, another product that's extremely widely used among enterprises is Adobe Experience Manager, AEM. It will very frequently have permission issues such that users can just browse directly to data that they shouldn't have access to, including things like plain text credentials. So yeah, absolutely. It's one thing about SaaS is that it's very easy to misconfigure into like a simple, simple uh, attack that doesn't even require any kind of skilled 
attacker to actually, you know, craft a specific payload to get access to the data. Yeah, thanks for digging into that because I think it also highlights too, right? Vendors, there's no, there's no shame on any of these SaaS vendors. They're just doing, they're just responding to what customers demand, right? If they don't build this in, they've got angry customers that are saying, I need the ability to share this with my contractor. Why is it so difficult for me to share this file with the contractor? Why is it so difficult for me to do whatever? Okay, there's a there's a product feature for that that these vendors put in place. But again, it's a, it's a, it's a double-sided knife. Beautiful. All right. Sorry, James. Didn't mean to hijack it. Not at all. Joseph, thanks for covering a couple examples of real-world use cases where you actually see these types of risks. I guess then the question is, what do I do about it? Can you speak to how practitioners can actually go and proactively uh, address those challenges? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the first thing I would say is that's what SSPM is, right? SaaS security posture management. SSPM solutions should be able to holistically solve the types of issues and risks that I mentioned before. Obviously, like, like security elsewhere, you can't necessarily solve and preemptively prevent every type of attack. But, you know, your SSPM solutions should allow you to detect it hopefully when it's actually occurring, <laughs> but at the very least be able to trace back the details to find out what was accessed, who accessed it and what happened. And, and the way that this kind of can happen is in a five prong approach, right? You need threat detection and monitoring continuously, hopefully, uh, which as I mentioned, can be pretty difficult because you've often got dozens of SaaS apps and then dozens or hundreds of instances of those, but your SSPM solution should be able to plug those in such that you're always getting normalized events. And specifically, the hard part is actually abstracting out the event action, kind of uh, what happened on this platform. And that's pretty pretty difficult to do. It takes a lot of expertise to kind of normalize that. But once you get that nailed down for all of your SaaS platforms that you support, you're able to build a cohesive narrative and write really specific and elegant detection alerts that will detect behavior that's malicious, either from an external threat actor or from an insider threat. You need to be completely scalable, right? So it needs to be able to handle as many instances of each SaaS app as you can and want to. And what you need is specific features that are built for scalability. So I'm not gonna mention any names, but we have some customers with some heavy usage of things like, like Salesforce or ServiceNow where they've got dozens or hundreds of instances. And how do they prevent users of those instances from changing security settings that they find deeply important and that they have determined to be against the risk posture for their organization. How do they prevent those from being toggled? Well, you know, your SSPM should be able to support a standard policy that, you know, either out of the box or ones that specifically custom policies that are for your org that you can then apply across all of those instances. So, you know, that's something that I think all good SSPM should be able to support. And the biggest way that you're going to be able to tackle these challenges and tackle these risk vectors is by having a single pane of glass to look at. When I was a SOC analyst, that was something that, you know, that most SIMs kind of promote and shout from the mountaintops that needs to be a fix. And it really does make a huge difference as an analyst when you're sifting through loads of data and when you're trying to find specific threats. Like if you're either you're threat hunting or you're going through an incident or a breach, you can't be bothered to search through six different pieces of software, especially when they have different ways to query or search them. And so your SSPM should be a single pane of glass into all of your SaaS applications, such that you can look very clearly into who has access to what, you know, what security settings are on or off for this specific instance of this specific SaaS application, what happened on this day at this time for, you know, these things. Your SSPM should be able to answer those types of questions for your SaaS applications. And then personally think that um, your SSPM should be able to, because of the fact that it's unreasonable that anyone would be an expert in every SaaS application, there needs to be a level of kind of like no expertise required. And what I meant by that when I threw it on here was that there should be default rules and alerts as well as default policies for all your SaaS applications, such that the SSPM vendor is suggesting, you know, here's what we consider secure versus insecure. Here's what we consider critical versus low. Et cetera. And so I think that'll make a really big difference um, when, you know, when choosing your SSPM solution and when also installing it and using it in the real world, when it, whenever it comes down to brass tacks, can I use this? Does it work? How does it secure us? If there's kind of like a no expertise required attitude being taken by your SSPM vendor, then hopefully they'll, you know, not necessarily need to handhold you, but those, those guardrails will already be there to help you make decisions that'll lower the risk for your SaaS application. So you mentioned the five-prong approach to the holistic SSPM solution and then some of the attributes here that allow practitioners to successfully deploy and leverage uh, the benefits of SSPM to the fullest. 
And on the previous slide, you also mentioned a couple, two specific risks and disparate SaaS applications. Can you give an example of how these features or combination of the features can actually help you either proactively prevent that risk using a case study or an example like that, or investigate and remediate a threat? Curious to hear about how this can actually be applied in practice, Joseph. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say that you were, you had a SaaS application you were using that's a clone or similar to like a Google Drive where you have sharing settings. If you disabled at the top level, at the org level, like, hey, our employees are not able to share documents with external users or create public links for them, then it would completely mitigate the risk that I was mentioning where an externally shared link to a proprietary document or to users PII got exposed. Right, just, it wouldn't be possible in the application if someone tried to browse the link. It would just give them a 403, you know, forbidden or a 401 unauthorized access. Similarly, if let's say you only share it with a specific contractor and that contractor's account were to get popped, how can you find out about it later? You know, whether they access it or not. When you're looking back through your alerts, through your event and activity log that was normalized, you're searching for, you know user dot name and then you you pop in that 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 um email address or the e or the username of the account that got hacked it'll bring up you know that access that read or access to that file that, that whenever they actually indexed it similarly if you you know were concerned that during a breach an attacker got access to a specific file you can do a search for that file name find out if they actually did access it or not fantastic well we're Coming to the end of the webinar, touched on a number of the things that we wanted to talk about today that Alec outlined up front, specifically sort of the state of SaaS and some of the challenges with SaaS, and just based off of the nature of disparate platforms solving very unique business challenges, the scale where organizations are leveraging hundreds of SaaS applications, some of the unique risks to SaaS, and then also some things you can take from a solutioning standpoint to hopefully address this risk up front and prevent any incidents from ever happening. I'm looking at the chat right now and see a couple of questions. We'd love to spend a couple of minutes uh, answering these right before we wrap up. But I guess looking at this, the first one is, and Joseph, I'm going to direct this at you. Can any of my existing toolings, like my CASB, address these challenges or do I need an SSPM solution? Yeah. So traditionally, you know, a lot of people will think that CASB is kind of similar, but where CASB is situated kind of facing towards the cloud and only has like a, a single vertical use case. It definitely is not, you know, comparable to SSPM in my mind because it solves such a such a thin slice of a problem and is generally targeted towards cloud. I, I think that some of the Casper providers have maybe slightly pivoted into the SSPM space where they've added a few small features of SaaS security. But in general, your SaaS security posture management solutions are going to be much better suited to solve those types of solutions. Though I can see the risk with conflating the two since most SaaS applications are actually hosted in the cloud. And, you, you know, you know, essentially SaaS does live in the cloud, but CASBs in general are not going to solve three or four of those prongs that I was mentioning from the SSPM solution space. Yeah, and just to piggyback uh, on that too, you, you can see it from the CASB vendors, Joseph, you mentioned it a little bit. Most of the major CASB vendors are either adding SSPM functionality in with a competing product or another type of product out there that it specifically addresses SSPM use cases which in our view is just acknowledgement that Casby is falling short. Fantastic. Thank you guys for the answer. Another question here with respect to the SSPM tooling, how would you suggest you evaluate SSPM tooling? What should you look for as part of that evaluation process specifically um, to make sure that the platform itself will successfully identify potential risk and provide guidance on how to mitigate it? I think first it's understanding what applications are most critical to you. So as a security team, you do your own business impact analysis. You understand what applications are most pivotal to critical business use cases. What holds your crown jewels within an organization? You likely already know that for on-prem. You probably know that for your cloud infrastructure. You likely may not know that for your SaaS applications. So that'd be a great place to start. And I think from that position too, of understanding that you're building out a program, you're really not just purchasing a product, looking for that partnership upfront in the interaction. You know, when you're working with the vendor, does it feel like they're selling you a product or are they selling you a program? Are they just going to hawk the tool of the fence and you got to figure out how to use it and figure out how to organize it within your organization, uh, figure out really just how to operationalize this product, this widget within a larger program, or are they upfront helping educate you about the space, 
building a program hand in hand that's going to make your organization successful. I would say that's probably the first and foremost. And you get that feeling when you're on a call with a vendor pretty early on. Is this largely transactional or is there something deeper that's going on? So I would say it's not a bell and whistle on a product, but I think it's probably the most important, important thing to start with is that emphasis on building out a security program. And then I would say next, once you've done that, whether you do it independently or you do it with a vendor to understand what applications are most critical, where crown jewels are within SaaS, it's then prioritizing those applications within any evaluation that you do with the vendor. Do they provide adequate coverage for those applications that you care most about? And oftentimes, you know, when we see with customers, they have tons of expertise, they have tons of experience applying controls across their enterprise, across various applications. They don't know how to do that with SaaS. So I'd say working with that vendor to understand how do those controls map to the product and then figuring out any delta that exists and using that as an evaluation criteria, right? If you have 100 controls for ServiceNow, Workday, whatever application it has to be, does that vendor cover the most critical controls or do they not? Uh, if they don't, do they have the ability to close that gap pretty quickly? Great. And Alec, we had one more question come in when you're talking there. You talked about building a program. Uh, what types of companies have found success deploying or rolling out an SSPM solution? And are there any attributes or characteristics that you've seen in terms of just tactics to roll it out um, that have made those companies successful? There really hasn't been divides between industry. We're seeing this apply to all industry. It's really more of a level of security maturity within those given organizations, not specific to SaaS, but just in general. Are these organizations very aware of their security? Do they invest in their security? Do they have the right aggressive mindsets within those programs to really explore where their blind spots are at and uncover those? I would say that's probably one of the biggest characteristics is, do you actively hunt for blind spots? And then when you find them, you look them directly in the eye and you figure out how to solve them? Or do you actively avoid blind spots because you don't want to know it's around the other end because that creates more liability for you, that creates a greater challenge for you? That, I would say, above all else, makes the biggest difference. So it's not necessarily industry. It's that mindset that I think determines whether it's successful or not. I think that's it on the question front. We'll wrap up here and want to give a little bit of information about us if you're interested in learning more and digging into the topic of SaaS security specifically. So you can find us at appomni.com. Joseph referenced a couple risks that we've uncovered with the research too. You can find this, the work Alec and Joseph are doing at AO Labs as well. Uh, we have both of their contact info as well here on the right. We had a great time uh, chatting today about staff security, specifically the challenges of configuration, working through sort of the state of things, the scalability challenges, the risks that are unique to SaaS platforms, and really appreciated the dialogue on solutioning, what to look for in purchasing a comprehensive SaaS security tool, but more importantly, how to actually roll that out successfully. So hopefully use that tool to untie the Gordian knot within your organization. So appreciate everyone's time. Thanks for spending this last half hour or so with us, and hopefully we look forward to hearing from you as well if you're interested in learning more about SaaS security. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.